Welcome everyone. Uh, Lizzie Marx is a History of Art PhD candidate at Pembroke College, University of Cambridge, and she is our guest today because she made a marvelous, marvelous exhibition, which is also based on her dissertation, Visualizing Smell in 17th Century Dutch Art. And that dissertation explores the ways in which artworks described invisible sense and the meanings and interpretations that they yield. In 2018-19, Lizzie was an Andrew Mellon Fellow at the Rijksmuseum, and she was the research and exhibition assistant, as I said, of that marvelous exhibition, Fleeting Sense in Color, that was an exhibition at the Maurits House about smell in 17th century art, and she was the co-author of the exhibition publication. We we're really thrilled to, to have you here. I'm already looking forward to this uh, presentation uh, for quite a while. I'll put your PowerPoint on and the floor is yours. Great, thanks Stein. Um, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Well, um, thank you so much Stein for inviting me and um, I'm sure many of you would agree that last year the Leiden Museum talks were a tonic from the lockdown. And it's really an honor to be on this year's program, to be among wonderful speakers like um, last week, Maggie and Cindy speaking. Um, and I'm looking forward as well to the following presentations in the coming weeks. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Stein. And uh, today I'd like to introduce the exhibition Fleeting Sense in Color, which was on show at the Marwats House uh, from the 5th of June until the 29th of August of this year. And uh, as Stein mentioned, I was the research and exhibition assistant as my soon to be submitted PhD titled Visualizing Smell in 17th Century Dutch Art covers extremely similar ground. And I worked on the project together with uh, the curator Ariane van Suchtele and the brilliant and given the circumstances, very resilient Moritz House team. And as I said, we were able to open the show this year, but of course, um, because travel for many of us remained challenging, for those who could not see the exhibition, I hope that today will be some consolation for visiting the real thing. I'd like to give an introduction to the show, to go into more detail about the themes of the exhibition, and afterwards, I'd love to have a discussion and to hear all of your impressions. And I'd like to start right away with a painting. And it's a painting that is exceptionally cryptic. This is a self-portrait of Johannes van Weikersloot. And perhaps we could call it an allegory of the art of painting. He painted this in 1669 while serving as head of the Utrecht Painting School. He portrays himself before a painted rendering of the Medici Venus on the left and a modello of the Borghese Gladiator unwrapped from its blue packaging on the right. The artist holds a lit candle that props up some spectacles and a coil of paper decorated with sketches of sensory faculties. At the top are eyes that represent the sense of sight. There's a mouth that represents taste just at his fingertips. And at the bottom, there are these praying hands and they represent the sense of touch. On the right side of the painting, the two remaining senses are pictured. Van Weikersloot's hand studies, uh, steadies a drum and a drumstick, and that represents the sense of hearing, which is painted with a depiction of a young artist dressed in theatrical clothing. The young artist is in the middle of painting a sheep's head wearing a fool's cap who clasps a dagger in his mouth. And on the ledge where the drum rests, there is a rolled up architectural design, an illustration of an allegorical figure, roses, a bell flower, and a piece of smoldering rope. That is the fifth sense in the painting. It represents smell. And the fumes of the rope snake upwards and end just beneath the young artist's nose. The scent is so strong that it compels the young artist to clench his nose to block out the fumes. This is an astonishing detail, 
as the smoke manages to defy the painted dimensions. It penetrates the painting on the drum and enters the space of the young artist. Well, how to untangle this cryptic painting? Van Vikersloot could be compared to the classical artist Parasius, as the painted fume appears to deceive the young artist into thinking it is a real fume. Like the painted curtain that deceived Xerxes, Van Vikersloot can paint the natural world so well that it tricks his fellow artist. But Van Vikersloot develops the classical story. The reaction of the young artist is remarkable as he is covering his nose to block out the fume's smell. The smoke is painted so convincingly that the young artist believes he is seeing a fume and he imagines smelling a fume too. This painting can be read like an artist's manifesto. Van Vikersloot might suggest that an excellent work of art is one that deceives the eyes as well as the nose. This self-portrait was the painted overture to the exhibition Fleeting Sense in Colour, which was an exhibition all about smells in Dutch art. And the many questions that the painting raises really reflects the questions for the exhibition as a whole. Can works of art display the invisible substance of smell? How far does our imagination play a part in experiencing smells when looking at works of art? Like the young artist who pinches his nose, what sorts of associations do we have with particular smells? What significance did people in the past attach to smell? And can artworks even answer these questions? Well, as the first exhibition to exclu exclusively explore smells in 17th century art, this show covered relatively new ground, and it can only go so far in answering these questions. Rather, it presented our viewers with an opportunity to experience art with their eyes, as well as their noses, and to ponder over these questions. The exhibition consisted of seven themes. They were the senses, flowers, daily life, smells and health, smells from far away, scent and religion, and smells in stories. And the show had 32 paintings, 17 prints, six objects, two drawings, and rather unusually, eight scents. And before introducing each of the exhibition's themes, I'd like to discuss the creation of these eight scents. While the artworks are highly powerful in evoking scents, we also wanted to explore incorporating smells into the exhibition space. We were curious to find out whether our encounters with art change when we experience particular scents at the same time. Could we recreate the sense of the past? And might it be possible to experience the past in this manner? Well, with these considerations in mind, we created eight scents, each of which were connected to a particular artwork or object on display. We worked with the art and scent historian Caro Verbeek and designers at Studio Lauter to create a device that could diffuse the smells. The scents were created by perfumers at IFF, uh, that stands for International Flavors and Fragrances, and they're experts in creating the aromas of our laundry detergents, uh, cleaning products, as well as luxury perfumes. And to create the scents, I provided IFF with transcribed historical recipes and sources that I found. And the essence of the scent was stored in a, a flask, which is underneath that platform, and uh, through a foot pump, which uh, you can see just at the bottom, which is illuminated, uh, air is pushed into the flask and molecules from the fragrance in the jar are pushed out of the pipe uh, above and diffused from the funnel where visitors uh, would lean in and sniff. And the foot pump was used because it, of course, was a safer way of um, operating it uh, rather than using hands, given the, um, uh, the safety measures that were put in place. And the scents could still be smelled remarkably clearly while wearing a face mask. So now I'd like to go through the seven themes of the exhibition. 
So the first chapter of the exhibition opened with exploring the senses. Smell, of course, is one of the five senses, which is a notion that goes as far back as Aristotle, who demarcated and ordered the senses in De Anima. One of the most comprehensive ways that artists could render the invisible visible was through allegories and personifications. Smell is embodied by figures typically decked with their relevant attributes, either separated as part of a series or grouped together with the other, five, uh, with the other four of the senses. Mythological figures could represent smell, such as Diana, who we see here, the goddess of the hunt, and her dogs have excellent noses, and so they are often the animal attribute of smell. Lovers could also play out the senses, as seen in this late 16th century print after Hendrik Holtzius. A woman offers a rose to her lover, and he holds her closely and pets a sniffing dog. Holtius connects sweet smells with the sensuality of love. The text beneath the description adds an additional layer of interpretation. The verse reads in Latin, although a flower-filled garden is pleasing to the nose, bitterness is often hidden beneath the sweet fragrance. It suggests that in the same way that alluring smells can be deceiving, the heady feelings of love may disguise ugly truths. It reinforces that common idea that the senses were the pathway to sin. As allegorical scenes fell out of favor, the senses began to be depicted through scenes of daily life. Depictions of peasants tended to be satirical, and so the corresponding smells are rarely pleasant. This painting from the series of the senses by Jan Mienzer Molinar comes from around 1637, and the artist reflects the realities of daily life by painting a woman changing a baby. And the tobacco burning from uh, a pipe cannot cover the stink as the man on the left emphatically pinches his nose with comical flair. And as the man's nose is assaulted with the smell of excrement, the painting illustrates the limitations of our sense of smell. In these varying personifications of smell, we gather some understanding about the beliefs concerning the senses, such as how they can lead to temptation. And when the senses are portrayed through scenes of daily life, they illustrate the sorts of smells that were experienced in the Dutch Republic. Now, still lives are typically the genre that come to mind when thinking about smell in Dutch art. And the multitude of flowers that were depicted in 17th century paintings evoke varying bouquets of fragrance. In this section, we considered whether the 17th century viewer might have been interested in the fragrances referenced in flower paintings. One of the pieces on display was an oil on copper work by Daniel Seichers and Jan Kossiers, which was only recently acquired by the Mauritz House. And Sechers painted all of the flowers, including a branch of orange blossom, which is undulating there over the cartouche, and two bouquets of vibrant tulips, carnations, and other blooms, which are arranged below. And the polymath Constantine Hauchens, who was in fact an avid amateur perfumer, and there's a wonderful uh, essay that's been written by Inika Hausman in the exhibition's publication, which, which goes into more detail about this. Um, so Hauchens was quite taken by the works of the flower painter Daniel Seichers. And in a poem from 1645, he writes about a competition between Mother Nature's roses and the roses painted by Seichers. And according to Hauchens, the artist wins the competition because he is able to create the scent of flowers out of oil paint. So when Hauchens looked at Seicher's paintings, he was able to see the flowers, but also imagine their smell. And it was a happy coincidence to find this verse, as the roses that Hauchens praised are among this painting. And at the center of the painting, Cossiers paints a stone bust portraying none other than Hauchens himself. So Hauchens is immortalized with his favorite fragranced roses. And while this verse is a literary device to praise an artist, it does offer some insight into the mode of viewing at the time. 
viewers could pick up on the odorous qualities of the artworks, and through their imagination, they were able to experience the sense. A scene of daily life was briefly discussed earlier in the theme of the senses. And as personifications of the sense of smell played out through paintings and prints of daily life, these scenes showed how potent daily life could be. Once landscapes and genre scenes of life in the Republic are looked at through the lens of smell, the results are enlightening. Take, for instance, Pietro de Hoek's beautiful scene of an interior of a townhouse. In de Hoek's painting, two women handle a stack of linens that was stored in the cupboard. The linens were kept fresh with sachets that were filled with fragrance. Visitors to the exhibition could smell a typical composition used for the scented sachets. It consisted of a mixture of dried roses, cloves and musk. Musk is a substance collected from the abdominal sac of a musk deer. The recipe for the sachets came from a household manual known as a book of secrets. And one of the most popular manuals was by the Italian physician, alchemist and cartographer, Girolamo Ruskelli. And his book was first published in Venice in 1555. And the Dutch translation three years later was reprinted in numerous editions until the 18th century. And in the painting, the cupboard doors that usually um, confine the fragrance are now opened, and there's this strong suggestion of fresh fragrance linen released into the space. And looking all the way through the townhouse, um, it's my favorite feature in the background where you can see the houses outside. They're, um, they're also being reflected uh, in a patch of the canal. Um, it's very hard to see in this detail but there suggests um, what's going on outdoors. And outdoors, there was a very different atmosphere. Jan van der Heide's canal scene meticulously documents life in Amsterdam. Workers transfer barrels between the canal and the waterside. An infant is entertained by a child and a dog, and three figures glide along the canal by rowboat. The sense of the Amsterdam canals can be identified too. Beside the bridge, the exhibition's curator, Ariane van Suchtele, noticed a wooden structure that was used as a privy, where the refuse was emptied directly into the canal. And yet, a woman to the left is using the canal to do her laundry. Animal entrails, fish guts, rotting vegetables, and industrial waste from the leather tanneries and textile producers all ended up in the water. In the warmer and more humid months between May and October, the foul waste created a stench that was said to be almost insufferable. As Jaap Evert Abrahams' catalogue essay uh, explains, many plans were developed to purify the canals, such as flushing out the dirty water with windmills, building aqueducts, water reservoirs and sluice gates. And it was not until 1872, with the construction of a steam-powered pumping station, that the dirty water was flushed out to sea. And here, visitors were able to use the foot pumps at their discretion, of course, to experience the scent of a stagnant canal. So the reconstructed scents that accompany both of these paintings um, were put together to starkly contrast the pleasurable and the foul aspects of daily life. And one further scent of daily life that was available in the exhibition comes from the bleaching fields of Harlem. Jakob van Rausdel depicts this serene scene where the green me meadows are striped with lucid white linens. And the fields that were used to turn textiles bright white were famed for being picturesque, and the thriving market for such Harlem pure scenes may reflect this. In the bleaching process, the textiles were soaked in rank smelling lye, which is a caustic mixture of water and ash. It was then washed in sour buttermilk, blued with ground cobalt, rinsed in the dunes fresh water, and then laid out on the sun to bleach. And this was a sort of repetitive process. It took a very long time. And sources actually described that the buttermilk 
uh, that was used could ferment in barrels so powerfully that it caused the barrels to explode. So very potent smell. And the accompanying scent that we created in the exhibition was of fresh grass combined with the jarring acrid scents of lye and sour buttermilk. Like van der Heide's canal scene, there is this unexpected cognitive dissonance between the serene view of Harlem and the cloying smell in the exhibition. When the reconstructed sense of the bleaching field and the canal are married with the paintings, it adds an entirely new context to the scenes. Since the canals today are practically odorless and the fields are no longer used for bleaching, we treat the scenes as picturesque views of the Netherlands. But a 17th century viewer may have had very different associations. Perhaps the advantage of the paintings was that it took away the foul smells of daily life so that the landscape's picturesque views could be enjoyed without a foul distraction. This colossal painting by Jan and Peter van Meerevelt presides over the section on smell and health. It depicts Willem van der Meer, head surgeon of Delft at its center, with knife poised, leading a dissection of a cadaver before his students. He had already cut into the middle of the corpse and various organs are on display. Van der Meer used the Delft theater to study the impact of odors on the body. He wrote up the results of his dissections in an exchange of letters with the medical student Johann Neander in 1622, which was then translated into French in 1626. And he was writing at a time when the craze for tobacco had spread across the Republic. It was at the turn of the 17th century that tobacco imported from the Americas had become commercially available. The health benefits of tobacco were extensively debated, some thought it was a cure-all, while others believed, as we very well know today, that it could seriously harm the body. Van der Meer wrote that Peter Pau, who founded the Leiden Anatomical Theatre in 1597, had claimed to have discovered sooty traces of tobacco residing in the brain of a heavy smoker in one of his earliest dissections. But Van der Meer, who was um, really an advocate of tobacco, refuted Powell's claim by means of his own dissections that he conducted on smokers between 1615 and 1618, which happens to be around the time when this group portrait was created. And as no such sooty matter could be, found, could be found lining the cadaver's brain, Van der Meer used the findings from his dissections to illustrate the medicinal virtues of tobacco. And we have little further information about what van der Meer was researching in his theater, but these letters offer just a glimpse into the sort of research into smell that was taking place in that period. Van der Meer's interest in odors seep into his portrait. In addition to the suggestion of odors exuding from the opened corpse, there are scented objects scattered around the painting in the foreground, there is some smoking incense um, and some extra in the uh, paper wrapping on the right. Uh, fresh herbs are being sniffed. Um, there's uh, bay leaves uh, in the foreground and then the, uh, we can't quite identify the other um, herb. Maybe if someone has some thoughts, that would be very helpful. Um, and there's also a scented candle um, in the foreground, just to the left. And it's likely to be scented because two records of the Surgeons Guild of Delft mentioned the use of scented candles that were delivered from the apothecary. Indeed, the fragrances helped to temper the stench of the corpse, but they were also important in the anatomy theater because fragrances were believed to protect from disease. Disease was thought to originate in stagnant or putrefying matter and to spread through foul air. And this included marshlands, stagnant water and cadavers. So the stench from the corpse in the painting was believed to release harmful vapors into the theater. But the spectators take measures to protect themselves from the corpse's odor through perfuming their surroundings. Of all the fragrances on display, the pomander has to be one of the most beguiling pieces of protection. 
Pomander's appendants with hollow compartments that hold fragrances, which were believed to protect the wearer. On the left, the surgeon Jakob Schrittbord holds a pomander suspended from a chain and ring on his finger. Women typically wore a pomander suspended from a chain around their waist, as seen on the right. The fragrances in the pomanders could be stored in segments, and some pieces even designated the fragrance by engraving the name on each segment. So if we go from left to right, um, on the furthest left, it says uh, rosemary. And then the second uh, segment says schlag, which is this prepared aromatic mixture, which was usually used um, if, uh, to, to prevent someone from fainting. The next one is uh, translated as cloves, and then uh, rose, uh, followed by lavender, and then lemon on the far right. And another pomander such as this contained a prepared aromatic ball where all the fragrances are combined. This Frisian silver pomander in the shape of a skull splits open to reveal a chilling engraved inscription on the compartment's divider. Heide leve morche dod, alive today, dead tomorrow. And during bouts of plague, the message would have been self-evident. In a medical treatise on a chapter about the plague, I came across two pomander recipes, one for the summer and one for the winter. The summer pomander has many ingredients, including sandalwood, mace, lemon peel and rose water, resins such as styrax, as well as a dash of cinnamon, saffron, camphor, and the animalic ingredients of ambergris, civet and musk. And ambergris is produced in the bowels of the sperm whale, and it was also one of the scents that were available uh, to sample in the exhibition. Civet is produced in the perineal glands of the civet cat, and as I mentioned earlier, musk comes from the musk deer. And then in the other pomander, uh, the winter pomander, there was styrax in it too, as well as lavender, iris root, cloves, rose water, and again, these animalic ingredients of musk, civet, and ambergris. And both of these recipes, the summer pomander and the winter pomander, were recreated for the exhibition and displayed side by side for comparison. And the recipes are distinctly different. The winter pomander has more than double its portion of animalic ingredients of musk, civet, and ambergris compared to its summer counterpart. And this heavy concentration ensured that the scent could still be perceptible in cold temperatures. The summer pomander, on the other hand, consists of more fugitive scents, such as zesty lemon peel, and it creates a fresher scent that can still be considered today as reminiscent of summer. And it's really remarkable that our associations with the summer fragrance and the winter fragrance have more or less remained unchanged. I mean, when you do stand side by side and sample them, you can you can really associate winter, the fragrance of winter with that sort of winter smell. Um, so so it's fascinating that nothing's really, you know, historically nothing, nothing has changed so much in that in that sense. And um, as uh, cadavers were usually dissected in the winter, the winter pomander recipe uh, that we created may be close to the fragrance that Schilport here was smelling in the painting. So it's really exciting to uh, connect the smells, the fragrances to, to the works that were on display. Now, closely reading the recipes for the pomander raises questions about the origins of the ingredients that were used. Cloves, mace and nutmeg from the Moluccas in eastern Indonesia were imported as part of the Dutch East India Company's trade. And this led to uh, the Republic becoming a force in global commerce. The prosperity was gained, however, through exploitation, slavery and abuses of power in, which, in the places from which the spices came. The artworks and objects do not express this, dis this disturbing side of the Republic's history. This silver ship, for instance, speaks of commercial triumph. 
It evokes the return of the trading expedition of a Dutch fleet in 1599. And brimming with spices, the trip was deemed a success, which led to the establishment of the Dutch East India Company in 1602. On the silver ship's deck are four hinged flaps that can be opened to reveal compartments where spices were to be stored. The ship was probably moored at a table as a centerpiece that brought pleasure to the eyes as well as the nose. Over a century later, in 1717, this painting by Jan van Mieris shows how the spices are established ingredients at the grocer's shop. This painting was restored especially for the exhibition by Sabrina Miloni, and her work on the painting really made it practically dazzle. It was a, a remarkable transformation. And here you can see in beautiful detail uh, the grocer who's weighing out ingredients into a bag and a boy is taking one of the biscuits from the tin. And they're surrounded by sacks and barrels and baskets of different dried ingredients. In the containers lining the shelves, boxes labeled with mace, nutmeg and cloves uh, can be seen. So if you look on the top shelf, just to the right, it says fuli, which uh, in Dutch means mace. In, uh, on the lower shelf, just to the right, it says notmus, uh, which is short for notmuskat, meaning um, nutmeg. And in the background on the far left, you can just about pick out nachel, which is short for kraudnachel, uh, meaning cloves. So um, we can see exactly which sorts of uh, spices are being stored in this grocers. So they were combined in the exhibition uh, and turned into a fragrance to evoke the smell of the grocers. Paintings and objects like these showcase the allure of the fragrances that were, import that were imported to the Republic. And the pleasures that their scents brought were paralleled through the beautiful ways that they depicted or encased the scents. But behind these works of art, there lay a disturbing reality. Before moving on to the final section of the exhibition, this coupling succinctly epitomizes the role of smell in religion. In Catholic practice, incense works as a channel for prayers to ascend to heaven. Dirk de Bray here paints a silver censer from which smoldering frankincense was diffused in mass. The rose and rosemary correspond to the symbols of the Virgin. Mary is even included in the herb's name, rosemary. And by contrast, Catholic ritual came under fire by Protestant reformers during the Reformation. Frankincense had no place in the church where only the word of God counted. And in the airy St. Barbo church in Harlem, Hendrik van Vliet paints a sermon in progress. An open grave is pictured in the foreground as those who could afford to were buried within the church. And in the absence of incense, the stench of decomposition must have been quite awful. And the final section of the exhibition showcases a wonderfully diverse range of paintings from legends and the Bible, where smell plays a part in their narratives. Visitors were able to sample the smell of myrrh, a gift from one of the magi that the Christ child received. And myrrh is a gum resin from trees and the youngest of the magi carries it in a box. And frankincense is swung in the gold censer that the older magus holds. While frankincense symbolizes Christ's divinity, the bitter smell of myrrh is meant to represent Christ's humanity. In another biblical scene, Christ performs the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. And unveiling the white shroud from the tomb, two ghostly hands are elevated ominously in Jan Lieven's depiction. You can just about make them out sort of like the side there. It's very it's spooky, I would call it. Um, and Martha, the sister of Lazarus, had doubted Christ's ability to bring back her brother, as she says, Lord, by this time he stinketh, for he hath been dead four days. And she stands behind the woman with the shroud, with hands in prayer 
and mouth open in disbelief. And an epic Italian poem from the 16th century called Jerusalem Liberata is Willem van Mieris' source for his painting. And the story goes that the sorceress Armida intends to kill the Christian hero Rinaldo, but when she sees him and smells his pleasant odor, she falls deeply in love with him. And Armida uses a fragrant garland of flowers to ensnare Rinaldo to take him to her palace. And in the painting, the witch approaches the sleeping Rinaldo and she begins to bind him with the help of some putti. That Rinaldo's smell seduces Armida holds relevance to our own deeply personal connections to odors. The scent of our loved ones are distinct and can play a role in our feelings of attraction and can influence our emotions. In this final section of the exhibition, where stories from the Bible and legend enact the power of smell and its significance in the narrative, we are asked to consider how our own stories and experiences have been steered by smell. And that is con a conclusion to our very rapid tour of fleeting sense and color, and in broader terms, an exploration of Dutch art through the sense of smell. And smells in art can be explored through very different approaches. In the most traditional of ways, the sense of smell can be explored in art through allegories and history paintings where smells play a part in the story. But through researching the material history of the Dutch Republic, paintings of daily life also depict the scented world of the 17th century. Understanding the ideas about smell and health in the past can offer further insights into artworks. The sitters who are immortalized in portraits with pomanders illustrate how important smells were believed to be in protecting from disease. And by studying the Republic's desire to flavor food, to scent the body, and even to fragrance the dining room table, we gain knowledge about Dutch commerce and also the disturbing history behind it. It is important to understand what it took for the fragrances to reach the Republic, the narratives that artworks tell about this journey, and concurrently the narratives that the artworks conceal. The research and the process of recreating sense have allowed us to gain more of an understanding about historical practices and methods, and we can develop an idea of the atmospheres in which people in the past existed and how these atmospheres might have shaped their experiences. We can learn a great deal from looking at recipes and the sensation that it provokes when getting acquainted with the past. Now, it would be an overstatement to say that every artist was concerned with alluding to smells in their works, but it is certainly not limited to the pieces displayed in fleeting sense and color. And a case in point, is the tour of the Mauritz House's permanent collection that we have devised. The collection can be explored through the sense of smell with complementary scents made with the help of IFF again. And the stops of the tour include the scent of oil paint. In the work of Rembrandt, his thick application of oil paint would have meant that the scent of linseed oil lingered for days, even weeks after he completed a painting. And this stop explores whether fresh oil paint can be a distraction while looking at a painting. There is also the scent of sanctity that fills the air at the Assumption of the Virgin by Rubens. And apocryphal texts mention that at the Virgin's Assumption to Heaven, there was a heady combination of roses and lily of the valley, which were the attributes of the Virgin. And this uh, might have been the atmosphere that engulfed Rubens' scene, and it's an opportunity for visitors to discuss their own notions of sacred atmospheres. And the iconic Young Bull by Paulus Potter, which evokes the animalic sense of cows, the bull, sheep, manure, and the fresh smell of grass. And the scents take visitors beyond the confines of the Mauritz house and into the middle of the countryside. And it presents the opportunity to think of scents that transport us to different times and different places. 
I want to emphasize that there is potential for other museums to bring to the fore the sense of smell in their collections. There can be much to learn from exploring collections in this way, and new layers of interpretation can be gained. Collections should be accessible, and smells can help in making that possible. Beyond the Mawad's house, there are plenty more artworks that allude to smell, and it's only a matter of looking. Thank you very much, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. It was uh, really interesting because all of a sudden you get those many other extra layers uh, compared to, to, to us looking in front of a very picturesque painting, and all of a sudden there is that that other experience, which can really be contrasting, I think, with, 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 with what we would do if we see, for example, that wonderful uh, view on Harlem by, uh, by Reisdahl, and then we have that, that totally different. <laughs> you, 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 you knew how to describe it that well, that it, it, I really got it. I really got the idea that all of a sudden I could smell the, the Harlem uh, suburbia, as it were. So, uh, so that that was really interesting. There were many questions. Uh, let me just uh, do it with with the question, uh, the first question, and then I go go down. I also have many questions. So 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 let's 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 start. First uh, question of Ag Salver: Are there any scents of that period that cannot be recreated uh, nowadays? Is there something very particular in the sense of the 17th century? That is a really good question, and I just need to take a moment to think about that. Ah, what? Okay. I think, yeah, there there are, I think, so, so, so many scents that we, we cannot create because, you know, we have these, I mentioned that, that there are these recipe books, um, books of secrets that have these wonderful recipes that describe some fragrances that can be made. And that gives you a glimpse into, you know, it helps with following the recipes, but in a way um, that in itself isn't quite the most accurate way of, of producing them because um, I think there's there's still quite a bit of knowledge that is missing from the recipes because a lot of it is presumed <clears throat> knowledge. Um, and, and it's just that knowledge that would have been, um, it wouldn't have been necessary to note down because it was just, understood um, in that way. So actually for, um, you know, the sachets for Peter de Hoog's um, uh, for, for Peter de Hoog's linen closet, I think in that recipe, it just lists the ingredients, but it doesn't give the quantities, for instance. So so I think we can get close to it, but in a way it's not quite, um, it's not the most accurate um, depiction, um, uh, recreation of it. Um, but but that doesn't quite, I think, answer your question about is there th other things that we really can't um, recreate? And um, uh, perhaps there might be um, maybe some things for sort of health reasons might not be such a good idea to mm -hmm. to, to recreate it, 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 because of its toxicity. Toxicity. Um, but I I need to have a think about that and um, yeah. I, I'm curious. To... Yes, maybe we can come back on that, that later then, because there's that other question. Okay. I had a similar kind of question, but I first uh, will read the, the question of yours, and then I will uh, go, go back to my question. Could it be that a part of the experience artworks by audiences was not only picture what's visually happening, but also imagine smell and maybe sound or a material feel? And actually, what, what, what I had was, was the idea that certainly in that first, uh, that first painting, uh, by von Slaughter, Slo uh, there you do have a portrait of a painter, of course, who presents himself within the five smells and not only uh, the five sentences and not only uh, the visual, the, the view. So in that way, I, I was thinking about Junius, that, that early theoretician, and also what Tess Weststein uh, wrote on him. And, and, and what he said was that actually the ideal response to painting for Junius is the synesthetic uh, experience. In how far do you deal with that kind of theory? So you really look very carefully, and you really made that clear how you look at recipes, but do you look at those early theories of the impact of, of paintings as well, like these synesthetic uh, responses? 
Yes, absolutely. And this is something that if yeah, if there was more of an opportunity in the exhibition, it would have been amazing to explore. But but from my own sort of PhD research, this is something that I'm really interested in. Um, and Stein and I have had the opportunity to talk about it a little bit as well. Um, and I think it's exactly this point of the synesthetic experience. Um, of course, this is it, quite contrived in a way just to focus on smell. It, it's helpful to be able as a sort of to, to do it as a case study. But of course, isolating smell is in a way limiting because it's about the whole sensorium and that um, experiencing art is meant to engage all of the senses. And precisely that first portrait that we looked at in the presentation um, was showing how important it is to use all five of the senses because um, as I showed, each each sense is being represented in this portrait. And um, and so yes, that, that follows Unius, but it also works, um, and Stein knows far more about this than I do um, with uh, in antiquity with um, with in classical texts it's also about this sort of synesthetic experience and that's where it, it really stems from they're sort of developing what the um, uh, this the sort of rhetoric or um, uh, this sort of um, this, this value system from uh, from antiquity where um, a really compelling work of art excites all of the senses um, and then leading it up to today um, I really, having produced the exhibition and then visiting the exhibition, I think I, I began to really understand what all of these writers were were implying when they when they were um, uh, when they were incorporating this into art theory. Because when I, for instance, looked at um, some of the, the what I didn't show in the in the presentation for um, uh, for for time is. Um, there's a really beautiful Cornelius Bischoff um, painting of uh, an interior of a kitchen. And when I looked at that, I, firstly, I could imagine the smells very easily. But then what I found, um, I was really unexpected uh, by this, is I could start to sort of hear, imagine hearing the sounds that were coming from uh, the kitchen as well. Mm. And so, and I wouldn't have necessarily experienced that in uh, another context um, if I was sort of looking at it back in its uh, home in Dordrecht. So um, if uh, I, I think that this was a wonderful opportunity to do that sort of exercise of looking at works of art through different senses and um, and bringing back that sort of multi-sensory mode of, of, of viewing, which was a lot more prominent in the past. And I think we're sort of missing that today. Yes, interesting. Thank you. Uh, question by Marika, Marika Kiblusek. Uh, so remark on scent and health. Scent was not only used to make bad smells disappear, but was also therapeutic in itself. Uh, do you see signs of that in any of the artworks, huh? more in particular in paintings of uh, apothecary shops? Uh, and then is that a kind of early aromatherapy? Uh, Aline adds to the question. Yes, what a great question. Thank you. So again, for, for time constraints, I didn't uh, mention another aspect of the exhibition, which um, was a smaller part, but it's looking actually at uh, therapies for women, um, specifically concerning the womb. And um, this is, again, a, a very ancient idea that the womb was believed to be an olfactory organ. It was um, attracted to pleasant smells and repulsed by bad smells. And um, uh, there was also a whole um, uh, sort of idea of the wandering womb, where um, the womb was sort of this um, untamed animal, not not my words, um, that would uh, rove around the body. And in order to sort of um, make it, um, uh, sort of in order to tame it, you would have to, you, you could use aromatic therapies. And that's referenced in works of art, um, specifically in genre scenes of sick women, um, uh, such as by Jan Steen. And there they are burning um, a blue cord, um, probably from an apron, and that gives off uh, an unpleasant smell. And that's supposedly meant to not only stop someone from uh, the woman from fainting, but also to sort of tame her, her womb um, and put it back in its rightful place. So, um, Apothecary shops might refer to it. I haven't seen so many depictions of um, apothecary shops that, that sort of give enough information about um, those sorts of therapeutic smells, but I think that's the closest that I've been able to find um, in, in works of art that, that sort of allude to this mm -hmm. smell therapy. Oh, wow. so there, there was, was a therapy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, still extant today. Oh, there is, oh, there is, there is a change. Change. I don't know what happened suddenly. 
You did something with the mic, Lizzie? It's a very strange echo when I talked. And it's sounding okay to me. All oh, right, then it's just my SOS. Let me, yeah, I'll mute myself. Um, yeah, yeah, thank you. So, uh, Bram van Leuven, thanks you for that interesting talk. And he wonders uh, if you can say a bit more about the issue of anachronism. And so, did the exhibition address, for example, different historical perceptions vis a vis smell? And for example, what is considered odorous today may not have been deemed as such in the 17th century and vice versa. Yes, thank you. Yeah, this is a very, it's, it's very difficult because. Um, how can we how can we sort of travel back in time um in order to experience these ages how can we even experience these works of art in the most um in 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 an appropriate way because we are living in a totally different context we have different associations um and one example is um i think amber grease for instance I, and i mentioned very briefly that it was uh it came from the bowels of the sperm whale and um it is in the exhibition, it, it didn't smell particularly pleasant. It, it, it has this very, the best way, best way I can describe it is a sort of animalic smell, but underneath it is, is a very pleasant smell. And it's, um, it's actually still used today in a lot of um, perfumes, but it's a synthetic um, version because it's just too precious a material. Um, and, and so it's sort of, it's purer and it doesn't have those sorts of animalic smells. And so I think that I imagine that in the past, um, you know, it's easy to sort of block out uh, or, or one gets used to bad smells. Um, and so Ambrose is an example where I think the uh, the perfume sort of comes, would have come through and um, and would have suppressed or sort of muted the, the that sort of animalic aspects of, of Ambergris. Oh, that's great. Another question is about gender. Can there be a distinction made between male fragrances and female? fragrances in this time, roses, for example, did people look at this aspect differently than we do? I think um, from what I found, I mean, I just mentioned earlier about these sorts of aromatic therapies for the womb. And that's um, uh, that in itself is sort of gendered because it's it's for people who had wombs. Um, but actually the, the, the sort of the same ingredients are being used in perfumes in general. And, um, you know, I was discussing the pomanders, there was one for the summer and one for the winter. It wasn't one for a man and one for a woman. And in the recipe books that I've been looking at, it's um, it's very rarely making the distinct distinctions between gender. It would be seasonal or it would be um, for different parts of the body. Um, and it, it's funny to think about because, um, you know, today they're sort of, there are these very strong distinctions between what a sort of male fragrance is and what a female fragrance is. But um, uh, from what I had gathered, it isn't really um, the, the, the fragrances themselves. There isn't a gender di distinction. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's interesting. Certainly, since the whole market now is about masculinity or femininity in, 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 exactly. in perfumes, so that's that's quite different. But indeed, it indeed? may well be, but oh, I just. Sorry record I, I just haven't in texts i haven't seen it but it might have been sort of socially um very clear and assumed but um yeah mm -hmm. so question by Eileen: how would you work with the ability to smell the painting in a sort of way if you were to lead a tour through the museum as a guide huh? so so since you also say that this is not only the exhibition but also now in the mauritz house uh, what would be necessary for the talk accompanying one of the paintings so, so how would you deal with that yeah and i think it's um it, it does add this whole other aspect to it all to include smells in it and there's um you have to take into consideration sort of the timing and the diffusion of different smells um and and it does yes there's necessary training that needs to be done but this is where we um I mentioned before that Caro Verbeek, who's a scent and art historian, um, helped us throughout the process and she um, gave some really great advice for tour guides um, at the Maurer's house so that they um, are able to do really compelling and effective tours. And um, uh, I think it's things like having a, a, the size of the group being smaller than 15 people and, um, you know, having mm diffusing sense in a way that um, is not overpowering, but also not too subtle. Um, and we did a lot of different sorts of experiments to see um, what was the best way of doing that. Um, but it's also, 
Um, it, I think another consideration is that um, because it'll be um, working with people with different sorts of needs, for instance, uh, people who um, are visually impaired can take part in those tours because, of course, it's um, using smells to enrich the tour. And so then that um, would uh, have to be taken into consideration by a guide and how um, uh, and how to make that the most accessible for them. That's another consideration that we had. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's it's really I'm really looking forward to hearing um, yeah what people's experiences are of it. Yes. Then a question by V. Uh, I always learned that people who could afford it were the commander. Where would that surpass the smell in the streets and elsewhere? So it's an expression of riches, but in the same time, it also really spreads your riches. So. Yeah, um, yeah. I think a pomander was definitely a, a status symbol. The ones that you see in the um, in the portrait, especially the one the portrait of the woman with the pomander from her um, hanging from her uh, from a chain around her waist. That is an extremely expensive piece of jewelry, and the fragrances inside would have been expensive as well. Um, I think I get a little bit more skeptical about how much it w acted like a sort of incense burner in, in sort of creating a whole fragrance around you. I think that the, the, the way in which pomanders were used was sort of holding them close to the nose rather than people beyond your surroundings being able to perceive it. Um, but I think uh, seeing this piece of jewelry would have been a clear indication, maybe not the, the fragrances for people further away from you. Interesting. The, the last question and the last minutes I'm going to use to put my own question, but uh, I'm going to, to 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 go back to that wonderful portrait of of Huygens, uh, yeah. Because I was not only taken by the flowers, but also where is it? I, I just missed it. Uh, it's over. You know the number. I don't find it. Oh, there it is. I got it. So. Um, I was really struck not only by the flowers, but all, also by that really abundant cartouche. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 of course, uh, Ranir Basin is our, our our professor of decorative arts. is a specialist in the oracular style. This is not really oracular style, but it it comes close to it. It's a bit later oracular style than 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 than, than the classical one. But still, the oracular is of course the ear. But this also. I don't know. Does this very abundant uh, cartouche also invites to to smell in one way or another? I know it's a strange question, but I was just struck by that. It's really there, the cartouche. But you, I mean, would it be that? In what aspect would the smell be related to the smell? Uh, that would the cartouche be related to the smell? Because the whole the whole form is is something organic. It's 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 maybe something like like trying to make that that way of smelling visually the the act of smelling in one way or another. It's it's that way of taking breath from your nose and getting breath in. Or maybe I'm, I'm maybe that's why I also asked this question as the last one because it's a, maybe a very strange question. But the the whole way that on the one hand the portrait and then those those very dominant flowers and you made a wonderful case by saying that it's also about the the, the scent of the colors but what about the cartouche can you not involve that as well in in that analysis i like mean pointing at the organ of smelling or something or what what i would think of is just the the how very sculptural it is and 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 the sort of three-dimensionality makes it um makes it sort of so convincing that you would want to believe that everything else has this sort of, the, the, it, it really puts you into that reality, uh, this painted reality. And that the, then, you know, if you, if you, if you believe in the sort of robust strength of this cartouche, then you should believe in the sense as well that you're imagining from the flowers. Um, but yeah, I, maybe I need to think about this a bit more as well. I, I I'd sort of I'd bypassed the cartouche and just sort of gone straight for the portraits and um, and for the flowers. But yeah, I think I've been neglecting the cartouche. But it's just because also the word oracular is very dominant, so that of course refers to the ear. But but maybe yeah. it also refers a bit to the nose as an organ of smell. But the oh, yeah. sense of smell. But, but but yeah. I'm not so sure about it. That's also why I asked you that. The very last yeah, uh, curious question. Though. That's a good. Yeah. Uh, that's a good line of inquiry. Thank you. 
<laughs> but thank you so much, uh, Lizza, Lizzie, for for this wonderful, wonderful talk. You really opened up uh, a whole a whole new world. Uh, so thank you so much. And uh, next time we do have uh, Gary Schwartz. Uh, who will talk some uh, about his exhibition Rembrandt's Orient West meets East in Dutch art of the 17th century it's not only Gerry Schwartz but also Arnold Frolik or a librarian at the University of Leiden and they will talk about that exhibition the 14th of October at 18 hours it's and on campus in the Lipsius room uh, in, in in the Lipsius building auditorium 19 or uh, online because we will live stream it. Thank you very much, Lizzie, for being here. It Thanks so much fun. for having me. Really, it's it's been a real pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye.